Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 403, featuring the fourth installment of my interview with Steve Ince. In this part of the interview, we talk about uh, working with voice actors, uh, live action versus uh, 3D graphics. Uh, we talk about uh, Broken Sword 3 in depth, get some cool behind the scenes stuff on that. Uh, we also talk about uh, a Wanted, a Western adventure. And then uh, Steve's thoughts on why the adventure games genre has declined over the years and how it might actually be springing back to life here. Anyway, a lot of great stuff here. So without further ado, here is Mr. Steve Ince. Yeah, I mean, working with great actors is, is, is fantastic, you know, because they just deliver the voices so well. They give you exactly what you want. And Rolf Saxon, who did the voice of um, George Stobart, I mean, he was, he was, you know, he could just go all day and not, go off voice you know it's, it's just tremendous and it was a real pleasure to work with him and um he's, i mean he's just a nice guy as well you know and a lot of the a lot of those those actors are you know you just you you sort of you have a chat with them in, in between sessions and stuff like this and they're just fantastic people and and you know a lot of them really get games as well. They get what you know like the fact that you have to do variations of lines or maybe kind of like whole scenes you know oh this we're doing this version of the scene you know because such and such and this version of the scene because uh, it's you know it's a different choice and so on and that and that works you know when they get that you know sort of like they just they just go it whereas an actor who doesn't understand the the way that you have that within games says haven't we just recorded this why is this? Why? Is, why are we doing this again? Why? Why is it? You know, <laughs> because it's a slightly different version of that of that scene. <laughs> you know. Um, so, but once they get once they get their heads into it, they they they're pretty good actually. You know, and they it, it becomes a pleasure. And you know, sort of one one. I mean, they get they get into the voice so much that they just understand the lines, and it's like, you know, I'm often there, kind of like to set the um set the scene and put everything in context if you like and um and i had one actress say don't worry steve we understand perfectly from the lines <laughs> and he's like okay <laughs> you know and that was that was quite a compliment in a way you know it's, i didn't have to explain the context because it was all there in the lines you know Did you ever and change that's, your that's... lines based on the way they're trying to oh, read it yes. and, and say well that doesn't sound right i mean you I say this oh, yes. instead. I mean, was it that kind of uh, on-the-fly editing going on? Yes, and I think it's you know sort of like you should always encourage that because you know sort of like it's it's not like they're delivering a completely different line. They're just com delivering a variation that works better. And I think that you'll always get that. I mean, in, particularly in games where you might write you know ten thousand lines. You know, sort of like, which is about 100,000 words, say. Um, and you're not going to get every single one perfectly. Or, you know, and these and these actors, if they get into the role, they often they often get into the rhythm and, and, and what's being said. So so sometimes you might get a line that, that isn't quite hooking into that. And so, you know, because they're they're in the moment and they're in the flow, they'll they, they often know, you know, a little better. <laughs> Yeah. Some, sometimes we're, we're a bit too close to the words that we write ourselves and we can't be as objective as, as maybe an actor can be. So, so yes, you've always got to encourage, you know, a little bit of, of leeway there. And, and certainly if it improves the line, um, then you've got to go for it. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. about what you were saying with the, <laughs> uh, the actors having to read the same basic line. And uh, one of the series I've played a lot of is uh, Her Interactive's Nancy Drew. Series. Oh yes, and one of the things that's always funny about those, and my wife always laughs, is that they every character has basically a very they say bye <laughs> or bye, <laughs> and it's the same like happy enthusiastic bye, uh, even if they if it's like a villain who's just you know put a gun to your head or something, and you know it's, it's this menacing thing, but then it'll be bye. <laughs> yeah, yes. so yeah. I'm on death's, I'm on death's door. I, I haven't got long to live. Bye. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I don't know if they left that in there just because it's funny, or they just didn't want to have the uh, the actor record three or four 
I mean, how hard would it have been to say, give me three or four different <laughs> buys? <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not difficult at all, is it? I mean, a good a good actor will will deliver all kinds of things, you know. So sort of like, and, and you know, so sort of, I mean, one of the best things is kind of like you need some you need some um, d- death sounds from the actors, you know. Sort of. oh, those are oh, well, at this fun. point, at this point, we're we're, we're just going to go for some screams and 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 death, you know, and deaths. And so you know you got usually got to leave them till the end of the session, so in case the actor harms the voice when there's grieving or you know <laughs> you know that sort of thing. And yeah, can we do that again with you know sort of a bit longer, you know, now a bit shorter, you know, and so on. You sort of like um, you're creating all these variations, and it's it's just you end up rolling about on the floor almost, you know, because they're so they're obviously serious, but. But they're also funny as well because they're out of context in in the studio. But so so yes, yeah. So what was it like yeah. this working with this uh, virtual theater engine? Well, that was the proper virtual theater engine was um, um, Lore of the Temptress, uh, and we didn't really properly use it again oh, so never for that. Mind. Because... Never mind that one. So yours, the one that you used was. What was the name of it? Oh, I don't know. It wasn't virtual theater. I had it written down here. We we. I'm not sure what what we yeah. called it. When we did Beneath Steel Sky, I'm not sure what it what, what it was called. Virtual um, theater. But the virtual theater renderware engine. engine. Oh, renderware. Oh, that was used for that was used for Broken Soul Three, um, which. Which allowed us to do the game on a number of different platforms um, through through the renderware. Um, and that that had a lot of problems using that. It was it wasn't as straightforward as it as it was sold, uh, but at the same time, it did allow us to kind of like you know sort of like create for PC, Mac, um, Xbox. I think it was the first Xbox back then. And PlayStation Two, I think it was. So you know, it was it was useful, um, but the trouble was, it was. I think Renderware was bought out by Electronic Arts, and then suddenly it had gone. You know, nobody could use it. So you know, if you wanted to do a new version of Broken Sword Three, sir. You you know an updated version. You would have to you know pick it out of of the renderware software. You know the trouble is you know so like sometimes these things get so tied up in into the into the tools and the software you know that that it's difficult then to do an updated version. It seems that was the recurring theme was how difficult it was to make the the game available on different platforms. Yeah. We talked about beneath the still sky and was it as bad as the Trying to make a Beneath the Still Sky for the Amiga? Is it that level um, of... Uh, kind of, kind of. Um, do? I mean, sometimes the, the problems are, 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 diff- are different. It's like we did Broken Sword for the Game Boy Advance. Um, wow. And we effectively had to re-implement that from scratch because we couldn't just port it. We had to re-implement it. I mean, one of the reasons was that, well, we couldn't use voices. And we felt that for that platform, there's too much text. So we edited the, the, the conversations down a bit and, and stuff like this. So there was an awful lot of work went in, into the, creating that. Um, and <laughs> was, it worth, was it worth it? I mean, did it, did it sell? I don't know. Oh, I don't know whether it was worth <laughs> it, but, you know, it was it was done. But what, what actually that... That happened after In Cold Blood, so we did we did that, and what that actually taught us was that we could do a direct control game, adventure game, because you know sort of like there was no point and click. There were, you controlled the character with, you know, with the the, the buttons and stuff um, on the on the on the GBA, um, and and so we we realised that that we could do. In a broken sword game like that, and that's where we started the the pl- initial plans for broken sword three, 
um, the Sleeping Dragon. Um, and that's why we went to three for part of why we went to 3D. I mean, obviously, publishers pushed for that because they wouldn't publish a 2D adventure. Um, so we went to 3D, but but Just we used flat the out wouldn't publish it. No, no, they were interested in us doing a Broken Sword, another bro- 2D Broken Sword back then. Hmm. Um, so we had to do it in 3D, and we decided to do it direct control, um, based upon our experience of doing the original on GBA. Um, so, so it all came together quite well. Just in I mean, terms of being of the writing, uh, did that switch to direct control have a big impact? Yeah, not really, because because what it did was, you know, sort of like when you went near an object, uh, an interactive object, it kind of like just popped up a little symbol. You interacted with it. It brought up a little menu, a circular menu, which you then, you know, you could choose to pick it up, pick something up, or if it was a character, talk to them and, and stuff like this. So there was, you know, sort of it was it was point and click without without the point and clicking. If you know what I mean, the, the fundamental principles were all there. Um, it was just a, a different route to that. Um, and I think that, you know, I think it worked quite well. Uh, as oh. I said earlier, you know, sort of it was just the fact that, you know, the, these locations were very big and, and everything was spread out quite a lot. Um, that, that, you know, sort of like I think was less satisfying. Um, I think the third one, that won more awards than the other two, right? The... Um, we I don't got know what nominated. the cells are like for the... Which one was the best seller? Well, I don't know. I think I think the first one ultimately is the best seller because it's it's yeah, sold on a number of choice platforms. awards. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it got some very good, um, got some great reviews. It got uh, Game of the Year from the Independent newspaper in in the UK. Um, it was nominated for BAFTA awards. It was nominated. For for a writing award at the um, Game Developers' Choice Awards or something. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it got an awful lot of attention, um, very positive attention. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed working on it, and I thought it was a good game. Um, you know, bias, <laughs> obviously, in the mix there. But, you know, it's a game I'm proud of, you know, I'm proud of being a part of. It's not something that... I would ever regret, you know, doing. But there again, you know, you sort of you got to live and live and die by by what you've done, haven't you? You know. <laughs> I get. Were you just getting sort of tired of the Broken Sword series at this point? Or? No, I mean, I'd yeah. have happily done. I, I, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed, you know, the characters and and if you didn't want uh, to stick type of stories. The, would you have stuck around for the next one? What? Well. Um, we were moving into, we we're trying to move into other areas. Um, you know, we, we were working on a, a game called Good Cop, Bad Cop, and another one called I've forgotten what it's called now. And but they didn't get, you know, we did some initial, you know, kind of like preliminary work, um, but they didn't get approval from the publishers. So we're kind of in a position where, in you know, a sort of like revolution couldn't really continue in in the form it was so we all had to leave (laughs) shall we say so i went freelance at that point um and i didn't get involved at all with the fourth broken sword game uh i haven't even played it (laughs) that would be be kind of bittersweet uh, i guess to try to place that one huh well you know sort of if if it was if it was great, then I'd feel um, they really didn't need me after all. <laughs> and if it was terrible, then what do you say? You know. <laughs> so so I don't know. I mean, I, I I I can't bring myself to play the fourth one. And then I was a bit. I was partly involved in the fifth one. Uh, I did a lot of story work and some design work with with Charles and the team. Uh, but then I had to go on to another project that I'd already signed up for. And so um, I couldn't really continue with that. But I was, I was involved initially. Uh, what was this project? I'm, I think I might have my 
timeline a little confused. So we got Mr. S you did Mr. Smoozles goes nuts in there somewhere, and then yeah, so yeah. blonde. What was the next big project after the after you left Revolution or your you sort of first big freelance project? The, the first job I got after going freelance was actually the Angus Christie oh, okay, um, thing, yeah. but that was that was just that was script editing. I mean, that was that wasn't writing as such. That was just a bit of script editing and polishing, um, just to check the the Britishness of the dialogue. Um, but you know, sort of, it wasn't it wasn't a, a, a difficult task. I mean, the writing was good. Um, and and there were just just odd things here and there that that I caught, but um, so it, wasn't it was like good. You to... came on board and said, "Oh, you should be so thankful that I'm here because this is no, a no, it didn't. <laughs> no, it was it, it wasn't that at all. I mean, certainly, you know, sort of like it needed an it needed a pass, but you know, it wasn't that you know I was kind of like correcting every line or anything like this. It was just kind of like some some spelling mistakes here and there, a few kind of like oh you wouldn't really phrase it that way because it you know sort of like it's British you know and things like this rather than you no know, there was no fundamental rewriting it was just you know sort of tweaks and polishes um, and then I got involved with a company called uh, God I can't remember though <laughs> the wanted. No, that wasn't then. That was a little bit later. Um, I think that was the following year. No, I got a, I got involved with a company based in in Holland, um, and um, that was a really exciting project. Except it kind of fizzled out a bit, and and so you know, sort of like, which is a shame, really. That would have been a really good game to write. Uh, and I can't even remember the name of the game now. But what kind uh, of game was it? <laughs> It was kind of it was basically an action game, but there's a lot of um there's a lot of story in it. Um it, you know, so the and and the the characters spoke in a very kind of um strange way, almost Shakespearean. So that would have been a bit of a challenge. Hmm. <laughs> even even though they were they, they, they were aliens. I wouldn't, to be in charge of I wouldn't want to be in charge. I wouldn't want to be the guy that had to make this sound exactly like what Shakespeare would have written. <laughs> well, you know, good luck with that, huh? Yeah, it's, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have ever said it was in a Shakespeare quality, but it would have been Shakespeare style. <laughs> yeah, sounds, sounds, I'm, I'm intrigued by thing. this. I wonder if there's still a. How far along did it get? Was there a prototype or it was no a beta we, version? Well, no, we were we were just you know the, the, there was there was a lot of kind of like um, level design. There was there was character design. There was the story was well advanced, but there was no actual gameplay created at that point. So it was um, just one of them things. Um, but then I got. I'm, I'm I'm struggling with the timeline now. <laughs> I'm going to look it up on my website. <laughs> I'm just having fun imagining, you know, some sort of Hamlet, the first person shooter, you know. Hamlet, the first person shooter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, dear, dear. Where am I? Oh, great. <laughs> Macbeth, the platform game. Yeah, the, the actual, yeah, Wanted a Wild Western Adventure was was the first one I got involved in that was actually released apart from the Agatha Christie one. Well, they were both released more or less at the same time. I think so, that one was, uh, you said Spanish, I think? The, wanted, yes. It was you know originally what? developed by um, a Spanish company, Re Revistronic. Um, Revistronic, yeah. And I don't know if I would the, have been aware of that. And the... Um, and the translation into English could have been better, shall we say. <laughs> yeah, that so, seems to be a problem, the dogs, the adventure game a genre. So, well, I mean, it's a comedy game, but the translation had lost all the, all the comedy. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's a that, slight problem. <laughs> yeah. So, so I had to kind of like, Almost guess what the jokes are supposed to be. <laughs> so, 
So what what they did actually they sent they sent me a Spanish version of the game because it was you know obviously quite advanced, and I don't understand any Spanish, but I could get the tone and I could get you know the, a sense of you know like the, what the voices were supposed to be like you know what the characters were supposed to be like and stuff like this, and and that enabled me to kind of like work out what the what you know where the jokes were supposed to be and what what sort of thing the jokes was, so I I event, effectively rewrote the english translation based on on that so it was a it was a rewrite job that um and i'm quite pleased with the way that that went and in fact fun, yeah. there was a there was a fan website called the inventory which decided that the that was um, best dialogue so i don't know i don't know whether they meant the original or my 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 version <laughs> i'm sure it was your version come on uh, well, <laughs> this is this is a, a thing though I think with adventure games, and I'm I've often uh, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this, but uh, the idea that you when you make a game these days, it has to uh, uh, appeal to a global audience, I guess, and it's going to have to be translated yeah. to all these different languages. And I mean, for a genre like adventure games, it does depend so much on dialogue, and like humor doesn't translate well. Uh, most of the time. I mean, it, is that one of the reasons you think why we don't see as many adventure games? Or they seem so uh, niche these days just because of this sort of uh, or localization problems? Um, well, it, it, it is a big cost. I mean, you, you look at something like Broken Sword. The original Broken Sword game had 12,000 12, lines of dialogue, um, which which is an awful lot, really. When you think that you, that has got to be translated into five languages from English. Uh, was it five or four? French, German, Italian, Sp yeah, four, apart from English. Um, but it's still a big cost. You, know, you have to do the translation, then you have to do all the recording. Um, so it's a big part of the budget, actually. You know, sort of like, um, and I think that, you know, you, you get, <clears throat> you get, to a point where it's probably not as commercially viable as it, as it perhaps should have been. I mean, if you go back to the early 90s, mid 90s, you know, when Steel Sky and Broken Sword were, were coming out, um, then adventures were at the cutting edge of, of game development because we had the best graphics at that time. Um, you know, because, you know, sort of like a lot of the action games were kind of platformers or you had the first um, first person games coming through with like Doom or or, or such. And they, they, but they were still pretty basic, weren't they? And they, they didn't have, you know, they didn't have much beyond the shooting. Um, so, I mean, adventure games were, were, were pretty, you know, kind of like up there. And the trouble is, you know, at that point, Adventures seem to sort of stay there, and all the other genres kind of like move past. Hmm. And and it's not that the audience went away; it's that you know, kind of like the other the other games were were getting better and better and and grabbing the audience. You know, and people who were maybe a bit frustrated by by adventures in in some aspects. You know, sort of like moved away. You know, onto other games. I mean, they've still got a substantial audience. I think it's just it's not grown. <laughs> it's obviously shrunk back a little bit. But even if you know, even if you had the numbers that that you were doing back in the early nineties, there probably wouldn't be enough to to make big budget games viable. Hmm. I mean, if you sold a if you sold a hundred thousand copies of an adventure game back in the early nineties, that would have been a huge success. Whereas if you sold a hundred thousand copies of the latest Tomb Raider, that would be a flop, hmm. wouldn't it? Really, or oh, sort of. Yeah. So, so you have to sell millions, and a big budget game needs to do that. And you know, something like something of the production values of Broken Sword, if you translate that to today, you'd probably need somewhere between five and ten million. You know, which means that you would sell, need to sell an awful lot of copies. Um, you know, yeah. sort of like to 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 get your money back, um, and I think that 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 is is the problem, because 
adventure games need an awful lot of animation and you know a specific animation um, if you want to do it properly. Plus, there's all the text, there's all the dialogue, there's all the translation costs, there's all the actors' costs if you're going to do full voices and so on. It's and it's not an insubstantial amount of money. I hope they'll make a bigger comeback. I think I think they will, but in in other ways, like the live action type. I mean, the bunker is effectively an adventure game, and um, it's just using live action. Um, and I think that there is potential to do that. You know, and, and the strength there is that you don't need to kind of like spend months animate creating and animating a character. You just get a really good actor and point a camera at him. Yes, he has to kind of like do. It might even be cheaper than trying to do like custom animations all the time, right? If you wanted. To... Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. You can even if you, even if the actor then has to do like ten variations on on a movement in a room or something like this. You know, he has to walk from A to B, A to C, A to D, something like that. You know, sort of like it's still quicker to get an actor to do that than it is to to create those animations. You know. I mean, if you I'm look, I'm at... struck by these 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 studios. They get the all these little motion sensor things all over somebody, a special suit, and all this, <laughs> just to animate it uh, into CGI. I always was like, why don't you just record the actors? I mean, what what are you, <laughs> you really is this really cost effective? By the time you've gone to this much trouble, it's yeah. I mean, if you want characters moving about freely within a three D world, then you really need you know those characters creating a three D. But, you know, you look at something like an adventure game and, and, you know, you go back to the old Tex Murphy idea and and that's becoming more feasible now because we have better technology, we have better camera equipment. You know, blimey, you can record, you know, such good quality even on your on your phone these days that, um, you know, you get a sort of like half-decent camera, you know, sort of like video camera for, you know, what, a couple of grand or something like that, can't you, these days? Mm. And and suddenly this becomes you know, affordable um, in, in a real sense, you know, and more cost effective than I mean if you if you look at how how long it takes to model a good quality three dimensional character, you know, in something like, you know, sort of like three DS Max or or, or what, and then rig them up and then animate them and so on. I mean, that's months and months of work just just for one character. Whereas, you know, sort of like a good bit of rehearsal and a lot of time, you can film that that character um, which, much more cost-effectively. And so that's why the bunker was done the way it was. I think the budget on the bunker was something like 70 or 80,000. Wow. Which, which is nothing compared to, a, you know, sort of like a normal adventure game, you know, sort of done in a traditional way. It's kind of like, I mean, the, the beauty of the bunker was that the the guys who did it, you know, sort of come come from, um, you know, a filmic background. Then they know about how how to organise actors, how to get the best out of locations, how to, you know, sort of like um, do a lot of post production, all this kind of stuff. Um, and so they kind of like they worked with people like me and a couple of other um, experienced game. Um, developers to to create the game with their with their filming knowledge um, and you know but um, it wasn't like they were coming to it completely you know sort of like um, fresh because in, in the sense that you know kind of like they played games so they knew how games worked it's, it's like what I was talking about earlier you know you kind of like you can you can latch onto this if you already play games so he was taking his filming knowledge um with his his enthusiasm for games working with a few experienced game makers and 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 you know sort of like pulling all that together into into something that that could um that could work as as a game so so yeah I feel like they're a lot more successful I don't know if you ever played one called uh, I think it's Dark Space No Jeff, I that one. one of my earlier interviews uh, uh, but yeah, he was, he's kind of like, sound like these guys. He, he was like a Hollywood filmic, a lot of film experience and all this stuff. But uh, so the game, it looked great. It looked like it would have been a great TV show, uh, but just the gameplay mechanics just, <laughs> you know, I don't want to insult the guy, but yeah, that would, if those had been better, it could have been, you know, a great game, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, I think it's tricky to, to get those, you know, we keep coming back to this, but that, 
marrying uh, the that marriage of the gameplay mechanics to the, the visuals of the story. It's just not an easy thing to get right. No, no. And I think that, I mean, even experienced developers um, don't always get it right, do they? I mean, you know, um, was it Dai Katana? You know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he'll never live that one down. But, you know, sort of, I think that it, it's it's sometimes, you sometimes get wrapped up in an idea and and get convinced that, that it's going to be, you know, the next big thing. Um, and, you know, you, you can get blinded by that. And I think that, you know, you, you need people around you to kind of go, hang on a minute, Steve, that's rubbish, you know. You need to... <laughs> Which is why, you know, I'm, I'm always open to, you know, kind of like, you know, feedback and, and, and so on. Um, when I did Mr. Smoozles Goes Nutso, um, you know, completed and released it. Mr. I mean, didn't Smoozles do it. Goes Nuts. <laughs> is it Nutso? <laughs> nutso, yes. Oh, I thought the name. Mr. That is even better. Mr. Smoozles Goes Nutso. <laughs> yeah. That's fun to and, say. Um, when I released that, it, you know, sort of like I was posting about it on a few different forums and so on. And um, one guy replied and, and immediately said, well, this looks rubbish. <laughs> oh, dear. You know, real, real kind of insightful critique. Just a troll? But, or was it, did you make a, did you have some points to make? Or? But no, pretty, pretty much that's, that's all he said. This looks rubbish. Um so, you know, it's very easy to kind of like react and go get angry and start calling <laughs> names and stuff like this. But, you know, sort of all I did was say, uh, so. <laughs> yeah, go on. Um, so I said, so I thanked him for his, his opinion and, and asked him, you know, sort of like if he'd given the game a go. And if he hadn't, you know, kind of like, would you be willing to do so seeing as there was a demo free? You know, and um, you know, sort of, if he still didn't like it, then fair enough. You know, no, no, everybody can can like everything. So he actually did that and came back and said, "I apologise. It was great fun. <laughs> <laughs> a lot better than I expected yeah. it to be." So, so you know, sort of like, you know, I think some people, you know, sort of like say things unfairly and it's a shame um but i i think that that you know you should never get mad back you should just kind of like try and engage with them in a in a civil way and and you know all credit to him he he apologized and and changed his mind changed his view about it so so you can't really you know ask more than that can you you know so so it's um it's very good of him <laughs> that's all for this week's episode uh sorry this one took a while uh, to come out it's kind of crunch time here at st cloud state but uh, hopefully i'll be able to stay on top of things enough to get the uh, uh, fifth and final installment of this interview out in a more timely fashion so uh, stay tuned for that uh, as always though i want to thank you very very much for supporting this show it's <laughs> Uh, the show is completely dependent on uh, people just like you uh, that step up to the plate. Uh, all I ask is a buck per episode to keep these uh, interviews and uh, reviews coming. So if you want to support the show, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. Uh, really appreciate it. It only takes a couple minutes to set that up. And also, if you want to uh, tweet about the show or post it on your Facebook or your discussion board, uh, whatever it is, I, I really appreciate your help. Uh, you know, what can I say? I'm very, very grateful to you uh, for keeping, for, uh, for helping me uh, keep Matt Chat in production for so long. All right, what about that news from the Matt Key? Uh, I should mention this uh, before I get into the news. I got plenty of these uh, Matt Chat medallions, these commemorative coins uh, left. Uh, if you want one, uh, just remember, 
If you've uh, accumulated over $100 worth of contributions to Matt Chat on PayPal or Patreon or however you do it, uh, just let me know you're interested in this. You know, I've already sent out the uh, the first batch. Should have those by now. Uh, but if you're a little, if you haven't, uh, you know, made up the difference yet, uh, but would like a coin, just let me know that. Uh, I'm not going to be checking that database all the time to, uh, to check on it. So I'm going to just uh, ask you if you want one to contact me, and we'll work something out. Uh, but anyway, I really want you to get these co uh, get one of these coins if you uh, want one. Uh, Robbie, uh, I think did a fantastic job on the artwork and. <laughs> You know, I think this is just a really cool thing. The people that have gotten these are really, really happy with it. Uh, they've been tweeting about them. It's uh, it's kind of exciting, exciting stuff. So anyway, if you want one of those coins, uh, just check your Patreon uh, lifetime uh, subscription or whatever they call that. Uh, and then you see how close you are. You might actually be closer than you think. And then uh, just let me know you want a coin and uh, how to get it to you. All right, in other news, uh, Stig uh, <laughs> wrote in about a couple things here. Uh, one is that the Underworld Ascendant teaser trailer is out. This is the uh, Stygian Abyss. A newly released trailer gives fans a deeper look into the game's environment, panoramic shots of dungeon surroundings, and bubbling magma. Not to mention weapons and skill sets players have at their disposable, uh, disposal to, to uh, cleverly best lurking creatures and overcome physics-based traps. Uh, so exciting stuff there. Go check out the trailer. Uh, Stig also wrote in about this. This is Horizon Chase Turbo, an arcade love letter to the 16-bit era set for a 15th of May release. This is a racer of grand nostalgic proportions inspired by the great hits of the past with music by Barry Leach. <laughs> I actually got to uh, interview Barry a long time ago, back when I was at Armchair Arcade. Uh, super nice guy, a lot of great music. I'm uh, really looking forward to see what it comes up with for uh, Horizon Chase Turbo. And then finally, there's an article up by Matt Martin on VG247 uh, with Josh Sawyer talking about how he thinks RPGs uh, really should be more radical, but hardcore players like us, I guess, are just too stubborn, too, quote, resistant to change. Uh, Sawyer says that stats and combat systems shouldn't define the RPG. Uh, instead, it should be about the player's ability to alter the storyline uh, through his or her actions. So I'm not quite sure I agree with uh, Josh on that. I kind of like those stats and combat systems. And uh, you take that away, it just seems like you have adventure games, which, uh, you know, it's a, nothing wrong with that, obviously, but it's not what I uh, consider to be an RPG. Uh, anyway, be curious. Uh, go read the article. Let me know your thoughts on that. I'd love to discuss it with you. All right, I think that will do it for the news. Uh, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I got one that was sent in. I just got it today, actually, uh, by Jeff, uh, a.k.a. Gotrek. Uh, this is a beer from his hometown. It's a Three Floyds Brewing Corp. Uh, Corporation. Space Station Middle Finger American Pale Ale. Uh, New Horizons in flavor. Uh, so I'll make sure I get a close-up of this label so you can look at that. Uh, it's kind of uh, interesting, I guess, kind of a well, kind of a red dwarf-like flavor to this labeling. Let's see a little bit here. Uh, from the dawn of time, humans have looked to the sky for answers. Uh, Space Station Middle Finger <laughs> replies to all from its eternal orbit. Behold and enjoy this bright golden American pale ale. And these guys are based out of uh, Munster, Indiana. Yeah, Munster, Indiana, Three Floyds Brewing Company. Uh, now, there's not a lot else here on the bottle. <laughs> it's got a fun cap on it. Uh, so anyway, I, I'm pretty sure Jeff has good taste in beer. So uh, let's get this thing open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of the Space Station Middle Finger here in this rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling this. Really nice uh, aroma on this. It's got a nice uh, hoppy uh, uh, aroma to it. That's pretty much uh, what, what I smell here. Uh, it just smells really good. It makes you want to drink it as soon as you uh, catch a whiff of it. Uh, no alcohol fumes or anything <laughs> like that coming off of this. Uh, it just smells really good. Uh, so let's give it a taste. Mm. Oh, that's a 
a lot of uh, flavor going down there. I definitely get a lot of that hop sort of malty uh, quality. This is this almost kind of a toasted uh, like flavor to it. Uh, just a little bit of bitterness there, but uh, I actually think that's just about right. Uh, the American Pale Ales, again, you're not expecting that uh, India Pale Ale uh, flavor with a really sort of intense bitterness and, and hoppiness. Uh, to me, the American Pale Ales just seem a little smoother, a little easier to drink, uh, especially when it gets hot, you know. <laughs> uh, but we don't have that problem here in Minnesota. It's still quite cold, uh, but hopefully soon. Anyway, let me give this another taste here. Yeah, this is a, it's a really pleasant drink. Uh, I'm glad <laughs> Jeff sent this in. Uh, I'd probably describe this more like a, a smooth uh, hoppiness, a uh, little bit of a bitter aftertaste, just about right though, make it interesting. Uh, it's, it's got a great aroma to it, nice uh, consistency. Uh, all in all, I think it's a really, really good choice. I'm gonna try it one more time here. Yeah, I mean, this is really good stuff. Super, super smooth. A lot of flavor. Uh, it, it's, it's, I think they did a great job balancing out that hoppy and uh, the bitter qualities of this. Uh, so something very smooth, very drinkable, <laughs> very enjoyable. Uh, anyway, I'm going to go a full five out of five on this. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with American Pale Ales, but uh, this one, you know, I've got no complaints whatsoever <laughs> about this. Uh, really tasty. And uh, so thank you, Jeff, for that. And uh, if you happen to see a Three Floyds uh, Brewing uh, Corporation uh, ale, you might want to check it out. I really love the, the label design. I'm actually kind of curious now what other kinds of brews they, uh, they do, because this one is certainly creative. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for quotes about dialogue. And I came across this one by Truman Capote that I thought was a lot of fun. It goes something like this. A conversation is a dialogue, not a monologue. That's why there are so few good conversations. Due to scarcity, two intelligent talkers seldom meet. <laughs> so ponder on that and see you guys next time. Excuse me, when did the Mongols rule China? I don't know, I just work here. <laughs>